Hi, I'm Ed Hagen. I'm a second grade teacher at the International School of Bangkok. I've been an elementary school teacher my whole life. It's something I love doing. Uh, Fiona came to work with our school for a couple years. And at the end of that time, uh, my head was exploding. I was a bit overwhelmed and I wasn't quite sure how I would bring the programming to life in my classroom. And as an elementary school teacher, word inquiry is like many subjects, it's just one slice of our pie. And I was wondering about some practical ways that I could incorporate it into daily routines and also how I would make it happen every day for my students in a way where they could have choice and also exhibit a lot of agency. So this presentation is gonna give some ideas and this is just the tip of the iceberg. I hope that maybe some of you uh, will come up with your own and maybe share them back with me but I'm excited to share these with you. First, I'd like to be really transparent with the learners I work with and their families about what word inquiry really is. Uh, morphology, phonology, entomology. Uh, this is just a little infographic that I can share from year to year and also refer to when working with students. I think co-creation is really important, not just in word inquiry, but in all content areas. It, it really pushes a shared sense of ownership and empowerment and agency. Uh, I'm going to just talk about four word inquiry resources that I co-create each year with the class that I teach. Um, this would be good for ages any, starting in kindergarten, maybe all the way up to intermediate. Homonyms are a great place to co-create with your students. Uh, emerging language learners really need to talk about homonyms and get some exposure, as well as kids in this age and stage group in general who are developing and solidifying language. Uh, students add sticky notes to the chart, and then periodically we will talk about them and decide whether or not we should add them. Uh, one example, I'm not sure if you can see it right in the center on an orange sticky note, a student wrote hurt and heart. So this can lead to a great class discussion about not sounding exactly the same and how these are actually different words. Students then use this co-created list to create their own homonym books. And these books are an opportunity for kids to connect visual reminders with print and then also uh, engage in some oral practice. On the next slide, you're going to see an example of a homonym book. And see how it was spelled. I put down a bear sure trap and I caught a bear. I walked barefooted on the sand. The parking lot was full of cars. I played on the park. The leaves mm. turn oh, orange fall. in the fall season. Fall yeah, I'm falling from a high place. Shake. I'm shaking hands with another person. I'm drinking a milkshake. A quick word about homonyms. Uh, what you'll quickly discover is your students will start noticing these words and adding more and more to the charts. This will lead you to class discussions, something I wish I would have done previously, but that I'm starting now is really thinking a little bit harder about some of the words. So in the little video clip you just saw, a student had uh, created a page in his book about the word shake and fall. Uh, this is a great time to go into etymology and, and talk about the origin. And this may uncover that these words are actually not homonyms. Uh, in the big picture for kids in early grades, this may not be that important but this is a great place to bring that piece into the classroom. I've used an affix chart for the last couple of years. Co-created charts like this are awesome because anytime a child has curiosity or interest in that topic, uh, it doesn't derail whatever you're doing. So 
kids can put up a sticky note and then that can be revisited later. Uh, that's an important uh, mechanism when, you're, when you have ongoing co-created materials in the classroom. On this particular chart, I would probably change the definition um, just semantically, it's not quite right. And then you also want to never deal in absolutes. And I would say that the words, uh, these affixes usually mean these things, but not always. Another co-created resource that I've used for the last couple years is a grapheme chart. And uh, this particular resource is very appropriate if you teach an age group where you are teaching decoding. Um, now, this particular chart in this picture is just kind of an organic sequence of graphemes we encountered after uh, our first couple of lessons around how the letters function in words. Now, one word of caution with this is you can really go down the rabbit hole of perfection. Um, so I really think you need to let go of perfection and embrace a practical stance. And what that means is, what, what can you do to help your students decode and spell? So an example of this, you can see on my chart, um, the class identified A-I-R and E-A-R as uh, trigraph, trigraphs. Uh, so there was some talk on Twitter about this, and I, I put that on this slide and you can see it. And um, I guess as a teacher, like I'm very interested in this, but at the same time, my main interest is helping my students decode and spell. So I, I just kind of wanted to shelter them from some intense uh, discussion around R being a separate grapheme and what happens when you start creating more trigraphs. Uh, I, I think that detail is important if you are a professional linguist or you are writing academic literature about this. But I think as a elementary teacher, sometimes you have to just get on with it and say, hey, for us, A-I-R can be a trigraph. This year, for the first time, my class created an irregular past tense verb resource. And this happened after we did three structured inquiries into past tense verbs. And there was a clear need for us to consolidate and solidify some of our learning. Uh, kids constantly add to this chart. Th this chart's fairly new, so we don't have a large collection of verbs up here yet. Uh, it, it really tied into a standard that I had to teach this year. Uh, within fiction writing, there was a standard that talked about um, showing past tense. So what was brilliant about this is we could transfer this into writing and kids, when they were fresh off of the inquiry, could then revise their writing through the lens of past tense verbs and when to use regular or irregular verbs. Uh, Fiona added some great context here by saying that irregular past tense verbs um, are an older form. These words are older in origin, and that's why we, we have irregular spellings rather than using the ed suffix. Another routine and also another example of co-creation is word of the day books. And this is just a collection of um, work where kids engage in all four questions. So they'll show what the word means, what's its structure, how do the letters function, and what are some relatives of the word. So typically once a week they'll uh, walk in and the word will be on the board and there's some scaffolding and some examples, and it's also an opportunity for social learning and, and kids can help one another. Uh, and then we'll review it as a class. Then they keep it in a book. Um, I'm a big fan of the Book Creator app, and they just keep an ongoing uh, journal of their word of the day. If we encounter a word that has importance or that we need to unpack and understand, we'll often take out our word of the day books and add the word. Choice is really important. Some kids are using styluses and iPads. Some kids are using whiteboards. Um, you can see students in the back, they're, they're writing on a whiteboard table. So I, I think that choice is really important. Some kids really struggle to use a stylus. Um, and I find that for kids that are developing their uh, fine motor skills, a, a large marker is a good tool.
Here are some examples of pages from students' Word of the Day books. Routines are a really important part of any elementary classroom. Uh, they provide kids with predictability and they also provide teachers with a break from constant content creation. So these are the four routines I've developed. Uh, one goes with each question. Now one question that is not part of my routine currently, which I want to explore, is the entomology piece. What's the history of the word? Now in the younger grades, this is important to plant that idea and discuss it, but it may not have as much relevance. Um, again, some might disagree with me, but I haven't spent very much time uh, exploring origins. A typical routine for meaning, and you're seeing a page from a seesaw activity. Uh, this year my school is virtual quite a bit so a lot of our word inquiry work happened virtually or through the seesaw app uh, this actually turned into something great i was really impressed with kids creativity and also i love the choice so we encourage kids to write reminder words phrases other words um, quick sketching Kids really enjoy this and uh, we always get a good laugh and it's fun, but it's really important that this is the first part. If you're doing a multi-day routine, it's definitely meaning is most important. So we always do this first to, to get to know the words and familiarize ourselves uh, with new sounds or, or new ideas. Okay, here you're looking at in the upper left, just what I would see teacher screen in Seesaw, that this was a recurring activity. So I would have this happen uh, on a Monday during virtual school. And what happened over the course of a couple of weeks was amazing. I, I never asked the kids to use images, icons, or emojis. They just kind of did it on their own. And it was great seeing kids engage with meaning at that level. Um, kids oftentimes don't know what the words mean depending on how you've curated the words. Uh, now, I had a lot, of, a lot of the inquiry work that we did in the first four months of grade two had a lot to do with vowel sounds. So I was intentionally curating word lists to highlight different um, graphemes for vowel sounds. Uh, the second day of the word inquiry routine that my class has been working on is structure, and, and this is pretty short, pretty quick. Um, at, in its simplest form, kids just box the base and underline affixes. Now, typically, depending on what point of the year you're in, you might scaffold different levels of independence and support. Uh, again, curating the right words is really important. I think the example you're looking at would be quite challenging. I think this was from the end of last year, not the beginning of this year. Uh, and it's important to give kids the, sca the scaffolds that they need. So the three suffixing changes I wanna have visible anytime they're engaging in this work. Uh, this has also led to a lot of discussions about word origin. So the example I was thinking of was the word research. RE in the word research is not an affix. And my class discovered that by looking up its meaning and studying its origin. When we engage in this routine, uh, it can be done digitally with a stylus, or you can just give the kids paper. So you're seeing some work from virtual school where um, I put the, the grid of words into a seesaw activity and then kids use the stylus. And um, it's great to do the work digitally, because then you can look through the work that a student's done and use that as a vehicle for a conferral. So if I'm looking at some of this work, uh, I might be seeing some misconceptions around an e-drop and how to show that thinking. 
Um, it's also an opportunity for kids to work together. So if you have a student that's not familiar, who's, I mean, unfamiliar with structure, you can give them a partner or a small group. Um, have a look at this screen and see if you can see some misconceptions. Building bases or, or examining how bases are built is, uh, I think, one of the more important routines in the early years because it's connected to decoding. Uh, tap spelling was very mystifying for me at the beginning and also just determining which letters are markers, which letters are graphemes, digraphs, or trigraphs can be really tricky. Uh, I find myself looking on Google sometimes, or sometimes I just email Fiona and ask. And again, with this, I think it's really important to maybe be transparent with your students and say, I'm not sure I'm going to find out. Uh, so you're looking at an example, like a, a mentor chart for kids who are engaging in this work online. Now, I think the kinesthetic connection is huge. And at first I thought tap spelling was kind of silly because it, the tapping and the kinesthetic piece is used by a lot of different programs. I know there's some tapping in Orton Gillingham. I know there's some tapping and, and movement in Jolly Phonics or other uh, phonics programs or decoding curriculums. But I find this one to be pretty practical. And uh, I'm gonna show some examples of kids connecting graphemes and phonemes next. Okay, uh, here you're just seeing, again, this is what this work could look like virtually. I, I know it's not beautiful or uh, amazing. This is just some practice. Now you're seeing 20 word lists. Sometimes you can make your, your list longer or shorter depending on what you're studying and what your goals are. I wanna call attention to the example in the upper right. Uh, we train students to say the word and use their phoning fingers to hear how many sounds. And when we're doing this together in an instructional setting, I often have kids hold up their fingers to show and then confer with one another. Now, the student in the upper right-hand corner actually wrote down the number of sounds that he or she heard to support their work. Uh, if you look through here, you're going to see a lot of misconceptions. And, and I think what's important is we don't approach this from a grading standpoint. That sometimes we, we might have kids give each other feedback. We might have kids compare notes. We might have kids engaging in tap spelling to, to check. Uh, sometimes we might show examples or models and then work together as a group to uh, work out some of the ones that were tricky for kids. Now, something that's super important and often overlooked is the base must always be boxed. We want to keep kids from spending any kind of mental energy decoding affixes. So in this example, this would be day four in my routine, I have a five day routine. And on day four, I, if I gave this to them on paper or digitally, I would actually, in the early parts of the year, I would just go ahead and box the base for them so that the focus of the activity is um, paying attention to the letters rather than the structure to make that really clear for them. On the fourth day, we, we talk about relatives. And uh, I think I made a mistake and said that how the letters function was my fourth day. Now, the order isn't that important. I do think it's important to have meaning happen first. Uh, I think I like to do relatives and also all the inquiry once kids have engaged with the words. So after they've worked with the words for three or four days, that's a great time to talk about relatives because meaning would have been solidified. Uh, so when we do this, we're either making word webs or we're, we're creating word sums. Um, Fiona has a great rhyme that I've used. Strive for five, two is too few. Sometimes 
words don't have huge families. Um, I think one thing that often happens is when this work happens, you're either giving them a matrix or you're going to have them refer to their co-created ethics chart. Kids will create words that don't exist. And it's important to give them credit for, for this work, but also to say, to, to allow the test, uh, allow the class to, te to test it, which means, have you ever used the word? Can you use the word in a sentence? And kids will often use the word in a sentence. So I, I think this can be really difficult because um, there's ambiguity, especially if you don't know if the word that has been created actually is a word. So I think it's important to be transparent again and model that curiosity and say, hmm, kids, I don't know. Let's look it up. And then I'll model the use of a dictionary or maybe an online resource. So on the fifth day of this five-day routine, uh, we actually get into the inquiry. And I think it's important to do that at the end so that kids are familiar with the words. They can decode them. They know what they mean. They're familiar with the structure. Um, now, sorting routines can really vary. So I've been experimenting and trying different sorting routines. I, I know you inquiry purists out there might scoff at my work, um, but I'm going to just use kind of the tired analogy around swimming pools. So shallow end or deep end of inquiry. So in, in word inquiry, I feel like something that's kind of in the shallow end would be highly structured, many scaffolds um, are provided by the teacher, and the outcome may actually be named. You might actually tell the class, uh, at the end of this time, you will blank, or you, you might provide some scaffolding around that. Now, as kids become more skilled, or you want to provide some differentiation, you can use different inquiry routines, where you don't provide as much structure, there is no clear outcome or there might be multiple outcomes and there's far fewer scaffolds. So that's kind of my goal. And that goal may not align developmentally with kids in the early years, but you'll always have some kids that can engage in some of the work more independently. So I believe that you should provide that for them if it's appropriate. Here's an example of a highly structured inquiry. So this one had to do with past tense. And I created this resource on the document cam in front of the class with the class. Um, this was earlier in the year. So I'm actually giving some instruction on how to use scissors. I know some of you might relate to this, but after missing a lot of school, kids came back with some um, major challenges using scissors and, and a lot of fine motor issues. So in this one, um, we're giving some explicit instruction and we're giving some structure. We're saying in the model, I'm showing that you're gonna sort these words into two groups. Um, we're gonna then label the groups and then write down more words or corresponding uh, words to match. So the outcome in this inquiry is very clear. Um, in order to label groups, I find that this is often one of the most difficult things for kids to do. Uh, I really think it's important to co-create a word bank with the class so that when it does come time to name a group or make a statement, uh, kids can access the language. Here are some more details about that particular inquiry into past tense verbs. So one routine that's really helpful is to establish some background knowledge so before we started, I just showed the inquiry question, how do writers show when something happened? And then you can see some responses. And you can definitely see some pretty articulate responses um, that had to do with suffixing. So the class already had some background knowledge. So then we use that background knowledge to create a word bank. And in the bottom left-hand picture, you can see students using the word bank to name their groups. So the example in the upper right-hand corner is a completed sort of two students who, who followed the steps. This was a very structured sort. Um, so they've written down the present tense form of the verb underneath, and then they've created a title for each group. And I think the titles they created were brilliant. So this group said past tense verbs that are just a base and then past tense verbs that have in the thumbs covering it ed suffix. So 
they didn't even really know the word, the phrase irregular past tense verb. They just said past tense verbs that are still just a base. This is a little infographic I made just to share uh, the different steps of what this inquiry looked like. OR is a grapheme, like the word porch. Okay. So now we're going to actually talk about the ER sound because there's more than one way to spell it. Okay. So the first thing I want you to do is figure out which words contain the er sound. And I'm going to give you a hint so that you can self-check. There's seven of them. There's seven words out of the 20 that say er. Okay. Then I want you to get rid of the words that don't make the er sound. So all the ar words and the or words, recycle those. Okay. Make sure that you have your seven er sounds first. Get rid of the other ones. Then we want you to create groups and name them. Here's what each group is going to be named. Now, Mr. Hagen made a mistake here. You're going to put ER in these slanted symbols. This means ER. When you see this, this means sound. ER spelled. What's one way that we can spell ER? Do you know? EAR. EAR. Can you think of a word that says ER that uses the EAR graphene? Yes. ER. Heard. Like, I heard the phone ringing. So then he would write E-R, the E-R sound spelled E-A-R. Okay. Then I want you to add words to each group. So when you name your groups, you're going to need to look up here and come up with a title for each group. Okay. Does everybody understand? Here's some student work. This is an example of another highly structured inquiry into the sound that Y makes at the end of words. Um, this was several days. And the end goal is to just figure out which patterns make the Y say uh, the long I sound or the long E sound. Uh, one thing when, when inquiry is done, when, when kids have sorted words and are ready to move on, I often ask them to add more words to the groups. Um, and this just allows for kids that, that are solid in the concept to engage in more practice independently and also engage in social learning, but it also frees up time for the teacher in the room to work with kids who need more support to complete an inquiry like this. So uh, uh, one thing that we do sometimes is we have them write on sticky notes so they can revise their thinking or get a new one and, and then stick the notes on top of their sorts. Sometimes my class engages in less structured uh, inquiries. And this is kind of a generic cycle that I've been using. We typically do this after engaging in all four questions. So on the fifth day, uh, of working with a group of words, I would maybe give them something like this. And uh, I like routines that do not have a definitive endpoint. So this can keep going. This can help you avoid students following you around telling you that they're finished and asking what to do next. Because what, once you establish this routine, kids will engage in word inquiry the whole time and not uh, fixate on an end goal. So one important part of this particular um, chart is there's a word bank. And we've been working on using symbols for letters and sound, and these are some common words that they would use to label their groups. So here's some student work that went with that particular open-ended inquiry. I think the words that were selected this week, um, we were working on spellings of the long A sound and also the short A sound. And the list I curated definitely included some words that, that don't quite follow the archetype. Now my school's former program or a program that many have used words their way calls these words oddballs. And, and some kids in the class still use this terminology. And I know Fiona has something very smart to say about 
why we don't call them oddballs and, and what we're supposed to say, but I forgot. So uh, I definitely don't stop them. We, we call attention to these words, like in this sort, the word great. E-A normally says E, but uh, in this particular sort, E-A is making the long A sound. So if a kid says it's an oddball, uh, my typical response is, well, there's a lot of words that don't follow the rules, but look how many words do fit the pattern. And as a speller and a reader, that's what we want to remember. This student was engaging in a structure sort. So when we open this up, some kids might want to sort words based on structure. Uh, this particular student made a group called eDrop. So we were able to talk about that. Um, this is definitely where some different misconceptions may surface. This student uh, created a group called compound word and others created a group that said compound words plus suffix. Sometimes kids who are still working on phonemic awareness in grade two, I might nudge towards uh, doing a sound sort. And that might look like during a conferral and the student doesn't have an idea about where to start. I might say, let's say the words and listen to the vowel sound. Can you make two groups? So the student on the left was able to do that and was really impressive in the sense that they identified the word said using the short E sound. So as a teacher, I was tickled pink and, and really happy that this particular student had up their level of phonemic awareness and actually heard that and was able to articulate it using the correct symbols. Uh, the student in the lower right, I think they called this a spelling sort. So they were sorting the words into particular patterns associated with a particular vowel sound. And here is the child showing three so-called oddballs. So this is something we could probably do another inquiry into or uh, incorporate into a closing meeting or a class congress where you might talk about these three words and call attention to them. Curating word lists is really important uh, in developing and maintaining word inquiry routines or, or regularly giving kids opportunities to inquire into words. Uh, at first, I found this very difficult. Now I find it almost fun. I know that's very nerdy, but sometimes it's really calming to sit down and, and curate a word list. Uh, I picked the number 20. I'm not sure why uh, I have used fewer words, depending on who the students are, what their age and stage is. I think for grade two, 20 is quite a challenge, but also provides enough challenge for, for kids that are quite independent. And then uh, scaffolding can happen for kids who are struggling. Um, you can cut off one column or, or just reduce the number of words for them. Where do we get ideas for curating words? Well, um, I have to admit, I like looking at the Orn Gillingham word list. I also look at the words their way scope and sequence. And I think as an educator, sometimes we spend too much time and effort reinventing the wheel. Now, I know that... Uh, very smart people who specialize in the science of reading and linguists and all the experts have a lot of very, very clear research-based information to share about um, what scope and sequence should be, and, and I respect all of that. But back to the idea of practicality, um, this year I, I just felt like I wanted to have Word Inquiry connect to decoding and the needs of readers in my class. So... We, we had a, a focus on long vowels. So re regardless of the program I might use or any scope and sequence, vowel sounds are something that kids at this age and stage typically work on. So uh, creating some word lists around different vowel blends or vowel diagraphs or different ways of spelling long vowel sounds was where we started. And then I'm generally looking at my curriculum t to make some really clear connections but sometimes I don't. Sometimes the words might just be random. Thanks for sticking with me. If you've made it to this point, I hope that some of these ideas could be useful for those of you who might not be sure where to start. I just wanted to pass 
these things on so that maybe somebody else didn't have to spend as much time thinking and working on developing what you would actually do in your classroom. Uh, I want to thank Fiona for taking the time uh, to teach me all these things and also to correspond and, and follow up and help me continue to learn.